I'm Vikram Jandiala. I'm a Chair and Professor of Electrical Engineering and also Founder and Chairman of NIMBIC. Uh, the talk today, uh, which is about what not to do when uh, starting a startup here at the, at the university, is focused on trying to explain the, the nonlinear complex process which goes into both research and startups, how these are different, and at the same time how they can work together to produce repeated success here at uh, UW. So a quick introduction. Uh, so the standard engineering professor route, a good under, undergraduate school, a good graduate school. I did start off in industry and joined Ansoft Corporation, which became one of our competitors and it was acquired for $850 million. A very, very respected company and I worked there for a couple of years. I learned the ropes, uh, did good work there. And then I joined uh, here at UW. I got tenure in 2005. Realized they're not going to be able to kick me out anymore. What should I do? And of course, uh, Fred started pinging us, and that was the, the genesis of, of Fizzware. Uh, we changed names after our, our recent round. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And my roles, as you can see, uh, and that's why I think I, I'm capable of talking about what not to do, because I've failed in a lot of roles, okay, from founder to CTO. Very quickly, I realized students can, are really good at, at putting together uh, codes, so I don't have to be CTO. Uh, in a technical company, a CEO is not what you expect in a, in, in a technical startup. And so I did play that role until we got a real CEO from, from Synopsys. And then I sort of retired, as you can see, when I went to chief technologist and chairman. And hopefully I've learned enough to be able to do this with other students and other people who are interested. And uh, recently I, I was made chair of electrical engineering, which is a totally different story. So what does NIMBIC do? It started in 2006 as physics software company, or Fizzware. So it's, it's physics and software. We got funded very early with, uh, from Madrona and WRF. That, that was fantastic. Early enough that uh, you know, we could actually start thinking of how to push this product forward. And we had our latest funding round, and hopefully our last funding round. We always hope we don't want to raise more money. And this was a good round with Madrona, Austral, and WRF. We now have four separate software products in the space of electronic design automation. So what you're trying to do is you're given some subset of a large circuit, and you want to understand how is current flowing through the circuit? How much interaction is there between different pieces of the circuit? If you have a human being nearby, how much radiation is going into that person or into another circuit, which is EMI? So things like signal integrity, power integrity, power usage, and electromagnetic interference. You want to do all this in software because it's much cheaper to make a mistake here and correct it rather than uh, creating a chip and then realizing you have to go back and redo it. It costs about $3 million to do that. Uh, so for one, you can charge a good amount for this kind of license. Okay, so it's $50,000 typically per year per license. What we realized uh, that we had a lot of technology which is parallel simulation, which is if you have more computers, you can really solve this problem in a scalable way. But people didn't have large parallel computers. Even if companies like TI or, or uh, Sony has large uh, farms, compute farms, those farms are used for a lot of things, from database management to circuit simulation to, uh, to synthesis of chips. So things which are not, they're not really dedicated to one product. And so even though there are large compute farms, they're not really accessible. So we realized that working with Amazon, which is right in our, in our backyard, we started doing this on the Amazon Web Services backend. And, and so from the viewpoint of the customer, they are running this on their, uh, on their laptop. And actually, we are coming out with a tablet version too. But they're running this on a laptop. There's a button they say, run on the cloud. And the backend simulation all happens on the cloud while, while you're sitting at your, at your uh, desktop or your laptop. There is a long tail, even in this field, surprisingly. Uh, the top 20 customers are very uh, proud of their, of their um, large compute facilities. So they're saying, we don't need cloud. We have our own clouds. So what we do for them is we sell enterprise licenses to, to people in, in this area. And then there's this whole set of startups, fablets, design houses, just small companies who don't have large compute farms and also don't have enough capital to spend a lot of money on, uh, on software. And that's where we are attacking the market with the pay-per-use model. Okay, so you, know, you, have a pro you have a project due in three months. You start running your software now on the cloud. You pay um, per hour. And then when you're done, you don't have to be uh, using our software anymore. So that's, that's basically what we're doing with this cloud-based offering. It is a reasonably large market uh, for software. It's about a $6 billion market. But it's, it's uh, really uh, covered by four players, three. And then Ansys is the, is the new player, which moved in from engineering software, but recently acquired Ansoft and Apache and moved into electronic design automation. So these are the four large players. On technology, we are, we're fortunate enough, although we've been around for five years, uh, there's no real competition on the technology itself. And that's where protecting what you've done, not just through patents, 
but also through code copywriting and so-called secrets in your algorithm, trade secrets, are important. And how, you know, as long as you can keep this, that's going to be an advantage for you. And here's a competition. Two of them got acquired recently by Ansys. Actually, Apache uh, is not a complete competitor. They have some overlap. And uh, the person who started Apache, Andrew Yang, was a professor at, at electrical engineering here in the uh, University of Washington. Uh, he's had other successes as well. So the benefit, again, is you know, standard things which software companies will tell you, but it's all true. Scale, accuracy, speed ups, better business model. Uh, we are trying to reduce this cost, which is the uh, chip design recost. And uh, Fred mentioned a little bit about it. So what's a good exit for us? Well, we can keep growing and hopefully become one of the large EDA players, the fifth EDA player, or get acquired. This happens along the way quite often by a large EDA vendor, as long as you know our technology is going to be useful and, and used. Or, uh, this is interesting because other uh, people are getting interested in going back into software, whether it's a cloud vendor or whether it's a, a chip vendor, and that's another opportunity. But for now, we'll keep growing and, and uh, enjoying what we're doing. Here is a quick way to get a company up and running, and we'll see whether this is really true or not. So it's, Notice I use the word linear. I'm an engineer, right? And things in life are typically not linear. But here's your 10-step linear recipe for success. Think of a great idea here at UW. Get research funding at UW. Build your prototype, refine it at UW. You have not lost any equity yet, right? Uh, find initial adopters, maybe some company contacts here at UW, or maybe this is the time to start your company, your new company. Now you scale up, you, you talk to the VCs, angels start scaling up, you build your product, market your product, refine your product, talk to customers, very important, build user base, time everything right, okay? <laughs> Get lucky, these are really important steps, okay? Get rich and, and return back to UW. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, so. And then repeat these steps as many times as you want before you die or you get bored, right? So. And if you're still alive, you can write a book, you can give talks, you can get into board members. Okay? So that's your linear model. It doesn't work, obviously. But, but uh, it's surprising you know, how many books or, or papers or presentations there are, which are essentially saying some of this. Like, yeah, everything's fine. You just need to have these things happen. And if they happen, fine. You know, you're going to succeed. So I want to take a slightly different path and focus on what you shouldn't be doing, especially if it's a university startup. And, uh, and by removing, eliminating what's left, uh, we might be able to do the right thing. My claim is that you, the, uh, a well done plan for a university research based startup does not need to follow the, the extremely high risk profile if you're just starting off on your own. Okay? There's so much benefit of being at a university, we want to use that. That's basically what, what I'm trying to do here. Okay, so here's the sort of the 10 steps, and here's the first one, which is sort of counterintuitive, but uh, I, want to, I want to start with that one. Don't start with the end in mind when you're at univers in the university. Why? Because when you're doing the kind of deep research that you do in universities, you actually don't know where it's going to end up. That, that's very, very commonplace in the inventive process, that you invent something which is deep and, and something which hasn't been done before, but the way it's going to be applied is something you may not know, or even your students may not know today, maybe in a couple of years or down the road. So unlike in a startup where you don't, do need to keep the end in mind, at the UW stage, I would say don't start with the end in mind. That is, keep doing what all of us who are at UW are good at, which is doing research. Okay? Because there's also this other danger that you might end up shortcutting the whole research process and sort of cheapen the research process by saying, I want to get to that end, which is, I won't mention any, any examples in the real world, but there are companies which are not based on IP which do very well. I don't think those need to come out of, of a university. There's enough uh, people trying those outside universities. So the my idea is let's use what we are good at at the university and, and push that. Number two, don't, so I'd like you to analyze what's happening on the right. And, <laughs> I don't know wh why he's doing that, but uh, he's certainly doing it on his own. So we don't need to have uh, the, the, uh, uh, any longer the, the feeling that we are lone wolves. Okay? A lot of us researchers ha have that tendency that we are better than everyone else, and we're going to do this all on our own, and otherwise it's going to go outside our control, and you know, we can't really control the effects. We don't need to do that, and in fact, that's not going to scale. So. If, if doing research is stressful, startup is, is much more stressful because typically you've taken money from somebody else whose aim is, yes, to help you, but also to, to multiply that money, right? So, and that's the idea is how do you do that in a finite amount of time, this very small time window. So founding a startup is extremely stressful, so it's better not to try to do that on your own. So it's always good to have some level of multiple founders. Too many is, is problematic, but if you're the only one, 
you end up taking a lot of stress. So two or three is, is, is a good number for founders. And then it's good to connect to people who've done this before. Uh, whether they've failed or not, the, whether they've had success or not is not as important as whether they've done things in that area. So faculty, colleagues, C4C, of course, and the, the excellent uh, uh, community here in town of angels and VCs. It's good to talk early rather than try to sort of go in the stealth mode and say, I'm going to do everything on my own, and then suddenly announce something to the world. Okay, so that's something I would, I would say. This is also important. Don't think that someone else is going to step in and commercialize for you if you are on the research side. That tends to happen as well. That I'm not a business person. I'm not a commercialization person. I'm just going to do my research. Somebody else will find uh, a, a, a use for this. It's, it happens sometimes, but the idea is the person who's building the technology, once he understands what a market is, what the needs are, he or she is the best to actually improve or tune or adapt that technology because they know all the weaknesses, all the strengths of that technology. And passion and zeal, of course, are critical. I'll come back to this point again. Uh, so I think if, if you're going to take the plunge, it's very important to go beyond saying, I'm going to get a board seat, or I'm going to consult one day a week, or I'm going to do technology licensing. There are certainly uh, a lot of technologies which fall under licensing and IP, but here I'm talking about startup ideas. And so you. I would say if you're going, go the whole way, which is go and do the startup yourself once you understand how to do it. Now, this is something I learned the hard way, and I learned a lot very quickly, is we, as researchers, tend to be known for ideas. We want to be the first to be known for an idea. And of course, uh, when you're trying to get tenure on a promotion, pressures to publish are huge. But really, if you publish before protecting, that can be almost a, a failure for many, many startups. Uh, and any public disclosure can count against you, not just uh, presenting a, uh, or publishing a paper. It could be a presentation, it could be a meeting, it could be anywhere where you have some public disclosure that can count against you. So that's something to keep in mind even very on, uh, early on in your research. Why do we do this? Well, apart from this one, which is you're creating an attack landscape, which is I know where to, where to go in the landscape of IP, it's also a very good defense against others who try to then copy what you've done or or they claim they don't copy, but the idea is that you have a defense. So it's both an attack and a defense. And investors like to see this for good reasons. It gives them some belief that there's some IP behind this as well. And it is true that sometimes a trade secret or something you don't mention in your patent is actually more valuable. Okay, so you have to play this, uh, this entire process properly, which is when to patent, when, when to not give up what you're, what you're doing. Because patents tend to be things that people understand how to do things. Sometimes you don't want to give that up. So you have to play this uh, both ways. As, uh, as researchers, we think everything we do is going to change the world, right? Uh, NSF funded it, so it must be the next big thing, right? It's not true from commercialization. Things which are great research ideas are not always good startups. And you know we have limited resources everywhere, but patents are expensive. If you try to patent not just here, but in every country, Okay, now the fact that there's a lot of work going on all over the world means you also have to protect uh, yourself from other uh, places uh, in terms of market as well as development. So that can be very expensive. Maybe if you're lucky, it's 10K. If you're unlucky, it can be 100K of, of cost to do uh, patents. Um, and so you don't want to just push everything. Okay, it's not for being counting. I have six patents. How many do you have? Right? That's not really what we're trying to do here. So that's another thing where as researchers, and I'm putting on both hats right now on the researcher hat, we need to be really honest to understand, is there really something here, or should we just put this on the, on the you know, back burner for now?